I'm not sure the world, any one of us here, have ever experienced what we experienced a couple of years ago, where the entire world was in a lockdown. That happened before. It happened in Israel. They were hiding under rocks and in caves because they had forsaken the fountain of living waters. This was a generation that had never witnessed a miracle. They had never witnessed a miracle. They only heard of what God had done. And so the Bible said it was a time when people did as they felt. Everybody did what they thought was right. There was no preaching priests. And so God sent judges into their midst to try and remedy that situation. And what happened was that Gideon, if you read that story from Judges chapter 6 to 8, praise God. I'm just going to summarize because we don't have too much time. Amen. <laughs> if you read that story, Gideon went to the wine press to thresh corn. Listen. You don't thresh corn in a wine press. The threshing process is a process whereby you extract the seed from the chaff. And so you need to be on a hill where the wind can help to blow the chaff so that, you know, you collect the seed. He was doing the right thing in the wrong place. And what happens a lot of times is when people leave God behind, when a people have not known the miracle power of God, when people don't understand the nature of God, when things get rosy, when God's grace is at work in our lives, the tendency is to leave God behind. Because then the, 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 the reasoning is, I think I found the key. I have a job now that works. It pays me enough. And what you find is that you start to relax your engagement. You start to relax your dependence on God. You start to relax. And ever so often, God brings us back to himself. He creates situations. And so it's not every challenge that is the devil. In fact, in fact, I believe that, um, you know, um, when we get to heaven, we'll see that we have accused the devil too much. It's true. Because most things, they are not, they are not a consequence of the devil. They are just times when God wants to prove what is in your heart. When God told Abraham, take your son, the only son, I know you have two, but the one that you love, <laughs> God qualified it. He said, take him off the mountain. Abraham could have said, Satan, I rebuke you. And so there are times when the heart needs to be tested. This was a time Abraham had been working with God for a long time. But God still needed to test his heart. Now, what shocks me when I read the Bible is that when God came in the body, ha, he was, that body was still tested. How do I know? In the wilderness. So at every point in time, God will bring challenges in order for you to grow. Is somebody with me? Is somebody with me? Now, now you can cry, ah, oh God, hey, I'm the, the Bible said, don't deceive yourself. Say, there is no challenge that has ever come that is not common to man. You will not be the first one to be tested. Even Jesus was tested. And that test is always a test of the word of God. And so if Satan is going to challenge anything in your life, any test, any, the challenge is the challenge of do you believe what God said. That's the challenge of life. That's the only fight you need. That's the only fight. There is no other fight in this world. Please understand what I'm saying. In the beginning, 
the earth was void and without form, and then God said, God what? God said, let there be light, and there was light. And what God said brought about everything we see now. Satan will keep challenging what God said until the last day. And so God has said some things about your life. God has spoken. Now, these were God's chosen people. Yet, they were in lockdown because they were being harassed and they were afraid. Fear had set in. They had lost a complete sense of identity. And that happens many times. In life, circumstances, situations will seem to arise and they will challenge you. And sometimes we have, we have that word. <laughs> we have the word, but we don't engage it. I saw an illustration, you know, and that illustration really, really, you know, <laughs> excited me. God said, you know what? I have given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. I have given you my promises. Just exercise yourself in them. The same word that created heaven and earth, if you put it into your mouth, it will frame your world. It will determine what happens to you. And the Bible says, it says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Everything that will ever happen in your life will pass through your heart. It will pass through your heart. It won't happen if it does not pass through your heart. I'm not talking about your mind. Because your mind can think, your mind can, even as we are here, we are thinking now, your mind can be somewhere else. And you are looking at me, you are looking at me like this. And your mind can be, so. am I, somebody is connecting, somebody is connecting. <laughs> so your, you, the mind is a very funny animal. The mind is very funny. So don't confuse your mind with your heart. The journey from the mind to the heart <laughs> Is deep. God is not looking at your mind. God is looking at your heart. Because when it is in the heart, it becomes a behavior. You cannot, when it is in the heart, you will act it. And if we look at this story of Gideon, what God was looking at the heart of this man. This man was small in his own eyes, but God was big in his heart. When God came to him, he said, me? <laughs> you, don't, you don't know my tribe is the smallest and I'm the least in my tribe? God said, mighty man of valor. Why did God say that? When you begin to read, you find that he believed in the miracles that happened in the past, even though he had never witnessed one. He said, God, what happened? We had all these things that have happened. So he had a big heart for God, but he was small in his own eyes. And sometimes you find that people may have a big vision. They want to do a lot for God, but not with the right heart. But what God is looking for is somebody who will do a small thing in a big way with the help of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Gideon was not even ready to do a small thing, but God strengthened him. Three things God needed to change, that God changed in the life of Gideon before God could use him, his sense of identity, his self-esteem, had to be changed. Amen. The vision for his future and the future of the nation had to be changed. Number three, his relationships had to be changed. And those are three things that affect our lives today. You know, who, who influences your life? Who are you talking to? Who are you relating to? What is your vision for the future? How do you really see yourself in the scheme of things? 
Hallelujah. Now, Gideon was a person who didn't have much faith in himself. He had faith in God because he reminded God about all the great things God had done before, but he had very low self-esteem. And so he put fleeces. He put, he put fleece. He said, Lord, we let the rain fall and then let this one. He, he was putting fleece. We don't walk in the dimensions of fleeces anymore because we have the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. And we have the word of God, the rod and the staff. They are enough to comfort us. They are enough assurance that God never fails his word. And you know, the tougher things get because it's, sometimes it's difficult to not go into the realms of eschatology when you are looking at the book of Gideon. Because the Bible tells us that at the end time there will be perilous times. Amen. And people will, you know, do various things. Because when things get tough, what do Christians do? What are we expected to do? Because the Bible tells us the end times, there will be perilous times. There will be challenges. But God has called us to be people who overcome challenges. Say to him that overcome, I will give. Read Revelation from Revelation chapter 3. Seven places. God talked about to those who overcome. So you and I, we are destined there is a seed inside you, which is the seed of God, that guarantees you win. If you don't identify with that identity, if you don't see yourself as God sees you, it becomes difficult to fight. Some people have lost the will to fight. They have just loved the will to fight. <laughs> you know, Pastor, don't just talk about the devil. I, I don't want to trouble anyone. Just let me be going on my own. Praise God. <laughs> but the Bible says the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. Second Corinthians chapter 10. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what are these strongholds? They are the strongholds of the carnality of the mind. The stronghold of the vanities of life. The stronghold of what the people you think are watching you. <laughs> you know, somebody said, you know, uh, uh, Pastor, do you remember, you know, that shirt I wore two Sundays ago? I said, who cares? <laughs> who is looking at? You know, there are so many things that we, we think are important that are not relevant to anything. They are not relevant to your past. They are not relevant to your present. They are not relevant to your future. Yet, it is what is shaking you and making you take certain steps. God says, bring everything back to subjection to Christ. Let Christ become the center. Let Christ become the center. Let Christ become the center of what motivates you. When the heart is right, you know, I'm doing a, a, a study now on the right heart, wrong heart. You know, Abraham, right heart, God said, leave your country, he left. He didn't argue. Take your son, he left. He didn't argue. <laughs> Wrong heart. You can start from Lot. Gehazi. And I mean, may, just look at the Bible. You will see examples. Every destiny was a function of the heart. Every destiny was a function of the heart. Garden of Eden, Eve's heart was in the fruit. <laughs> you see? So where your heart is leaning towards becomes the automatic direction of your life and may become your destiny. It's not necessarily that that is where God wants your destiny to end. And the Bible said, the heart is deceitful. That is, there's a way that we can be deceiving our own heart by speaking wrong things to the heart because your lips is the writing material on which you write on your heart. 
So here was Gideon threshing corn behind a wine press. But he was a mighty man of valor. Hallelujah. 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 He was completely different from what God had in mind, from what God saw, from what was in him. And today I want to challenge you. <laughs> look at yourself. Tell your neighbor to look at you. Say, I am more than what you are seeing. Oh. Because I'm connecting with God this morning to fulfill my destiny. I have a destiny of greatness in God. I'm not ordinary. So don't look at me at ordinary. Just, just watch, 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 watch where I'm going. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. If that person doesn't look like they believe you, just tell somebody else. Just turn and tell somebody else. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. But most important, believe yourself. Believe yourself. Believe what God is saying. Believe what God is saying. I saw an illustration from Frederick Casey Price, one of the giants in the faith, you know. And he said, God, God, God said, cast your body upon me for I care for you. Amen. And he said, most of us actually don't believe it or, or we claim to believe it but don't act it. Amen. Amen. Brother Austin, come. Let me give you the illustration. Come. Brother Austin, come quickly. Amen. It's not part of the message. I just want to give this just some small jara, you know. You know if you understand. <laughs> Those who don't understand jara, you know, you have to pay to, for the translation. He says, so, okay. This is, uh, God says, cast your burden upon me. So, burden is something that is heavy. You know, so imagine that I'm carrying some heavy stuff, and I'm a Christian, and God said, cast your body, and this is God. God said, cast your body upon me. And then I do what? Okay, you know, <laughs> you know I cast my body. Okay. Now, when I've cast the body, what happens? I should be free. But most times, when we cast the body, we continue like this. <laughs> Where is the body now? Where is it? Where is it? Why am I still doing like this? Because, you know, in the mind, even when God has taken the burden, we don't actually believe it. So we don't act free. We don't act victorious. Because our mind has been so conditioned to this way. Even when the burden has been removed, even when God has worked the miracle, we are still thinking the same way. The burden is there. We are still... And so some angels will be looking at, ah, should I slap this person? <laughs> what is your problem? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So here was a mighty man of valor, a man that in the spirit... The destiny is already written to bring deliverance. He was stretching. He was stretching corn. Every way that the devil has deceived you, that deception is removed today. Yeah. You know, some people, it is, it is cultural. For some people, it's a sense of where I come from. For some people, it's a sense of, you know, how I grew up. For some people, it is the school I went to. And people had various reasons. You know, Gideon had several reasons. He said, God, wait a minute. I'm not sure you know what you're talking about. My, my tribe, where I come from, we are the least. And even inside that tribe, I'm the least among everybody. You, you can't be talking to me. God said, I know what I'm talking about. I know the destiny I've planned for you. My thoughts for you, they are good. You are not in a good place yet. My purpose, I have an end purpose, which is glory. 
You have to come on the same page with me. For me to manifest the grace. You see, when challenges come, when God brings things in order to realign our focus, it is so he can manifest his grace. Are you with me? When God brings a challenge, don't crumble. Receive grace. Because God is trying to remind you, you know what? I have a throne. It's called a throne of grace. At that place, there is mercy and grace equal to every challenge. In other words, now at different times in life, we encounter different levels. Different levels of challenge. Amen? We won't be called overcomers if there are nothing to overcome. We won't be called triumphant if there is nothing to triumph over. But they are in levels. But in that Hebrews chapter 4 verse 6, the Bible says that on that throne, at that altar, there is commensurate grace. There is, you know, there is, there is nothing in this world that God cannot meet at whatever level. Amen. There is commensurate grace. He says, if your own challenge is small, I will meet it. If it is big, I will meet it. If it is gigantic, I am more gigantic. Just bring it to me. If you can come to me, hallelujah. If you can come to me. So at the end of the day, when I look at it, I say, look, everything begins with our relationship with God. Everything begins and ends with what? Our relationship, our identification. That identification is an identification of trust. You know, that identification is an identification of complete dependence. That identification is an identification where you, 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 you know, you trust in God's plan. You know, something surprises me about this story of Gideon, and I'm, I'm going off script completely now. <laughs> Amen. You know, the Amalekites and the Midianites, they gathered to fight them. 135,000, an army of 135,000. Gideon had the, begun the work by destroying the idols in his father's house. And so people already saw that the hand of God is in this man. It's like God is going to use this man. He blew the trumpet and 32,000 people turned up. Now, 32,000 people to fight 135,000, <laughs> that in itself was a miracle. Are you with me? 135,000 armed men ready to destroy We are in the field. And Gideon said, hey, men, arise! And 32,000 came out. And then God looked at him and God said, no, this this 32,000, they are too many. He said, let everybody who's afraid, those who don't have faith, let them go back. <laughs> of course, 32 people looking at one 35,000. <laughs> this is suicide. We are, we are surely going to die. And so 22,000 of them left, leaving 10,000. Listen, 22,000 left. Within reason, you will say they were justified to live because their life was precious to them. Someone will have said, okay, what will I say? I mean, you know, 32,000 against 135,000, they will just <laughs> wipe us away like that, you know. But out of the 10,000, God looked at them and God said, no, you know, there are still too many. I'm going to select the ones I will use. One, so that the glory can be God's. 
Number two, because God's ways are not our ways. And listen to God's ways in this, in this story, because sometimes we may just miss it. God separated them at the water. In other words, when he said those who had fear should go, and 22,000 left, it meant 10,000 had faith. Hmm? It meant 10,000 had faith. But those who claimed to have faith had to be separated at the water. The water always represents in the Bible the word of God. They had to be separated at the waters. And when they got to the place of the waters, some just dipped their head into it. And then some scooped it with their hand and drank. And you know what that represented? The fivefold ministry, the doctrine of the fivefold. What has been laid down as the tenets of faith? So I can claim, I can claim to have faith, but it is not the faith according to how the word of God works. Amen? Amen? I can claim to have it and I'm praying and my prayer is just in somebody's pocket. My prayer is not God supply my need. My prayer is that, oh, I know Brother Austin has the money. God touch his heart, oh. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Now, that, that, is not, that is not the approach. So, God, God weeded away those who just buried their head there. They are not, they are not asking, they are not burying. They are not burying in their approach to faith. They are not burying, they are not looking at the word again. Is this the pattern? Is this how Jesus did it? Is this how the apostles did it? Is this how it worked in the book of Acts? Is this according to the ways of God? Hallelujah. And God said, this is enough. And what was the weapon? Remember, you know, the, the word of God is sweet. You remember when God met Gideon, Gideon was stretching what? He was stretching corn. He was removing the outer garment for the seed. Eh? That is what God used as the instrument of warfare. Listen, torch, light, clay, trumpet. That until the outer nature is dealt with, the light within cannot come out. When the light within comes out, it is a trumpet that will scatter your enemies. Rise up to your feet. Drink on that, drink on that, drink on that. Hallelujah. Drink on that. Listen, when, you, when the outer is dealt with and the light, there is, there is light inside you. Tell somebody there is light inside you. <laughs> Woo! When that light comes and shines, the trumpet of God will scatter the enemy. 300 of them, they defeated 135,000. The day has not come that darkness will stop light. Do you know? If there was total darkness over the whole of Sunderland, and that darkness is so thick, and I bring a matchstick, one matchstick, and I strike it, do you know it will light? It will what? And it will give light. The whole of that darkness cannot stop it from lighting. Cannot. It doesn't have the power to do so. That is the power of light. Light is independent of darkness. When light comes, darkness must recede. It is not how, how big or how powerful or how wide or, or whatever. 
it cannot just stop light. But light can affect it. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is light inside you. I said there is light inside you. And that light speaks a language <laughs> that is like a trumpet. You know, when um, Pastor Justin was, um, when he was sharing the, the uh, prayer of consecration, he said something, and, and I just laughed because it was one of the things that I, I, I had prepared this morning, that after two fleeces, it took a dream by a Midianite to convince Gideon. What was that dream? The man said he dreamt that a bread, a, a loaf of bread, rolled into the camp <laughs> and defeated all of them. A loaf of bread. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. The Bible says, we are one bread. So the, the power of the 300 was the power of the unity of light. The power of unity. Amen. Amen. They waited, they broke the pictures. We are one body. When everyone finds their place and begins to operate at the dimension they are meant to operate, nothing can stop us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so the, the, the faith and fellowship and Christianity is not to be practiced alone. Even God is not alone. Everything started with let us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everything started with what? Let us. And sometimes some of the challenges to our progress is overcoming the mind and the self, the, the selfishness, the not wanting to share, even sometimes fellowship. Amen. Fellowship. There are people that you are destined to minister to. I was sharing somewhere yesterday online, and I said, listen, as a believer, the greatest way to receive from God is to give what you have received. You know, I'm, I'm sharing a message this morning and I, I, I tell you, I love to share. In fact, every, every morning, I share every morning. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Because I understand that the more I give, the more God reveals to me. You may not have a pulpit. You may not have a chance to stand in front of the church. But everyone that visits you, everyone that calls you, is an opportunity to say, you know what I had in church today? <laughs> I just saw the scripture in a new way. I'm telling you, when you begin to give, begin to give something spiritual to everyone you meet at every opportunity, it will not be every time you have a chance, but every opportunity Find something of the spirit to share. Give somebody else. Amen. Amen. If it's somebody who is not ready to listen, say, can I, can I, can I pray with you? Pray. Give something. Look, I tell you, your, your life will change because once you give, God sees you as a place to visit. When you hold back, you are on your own. <laughs> you're, you're on your own. Amen. Amen. And so you may not so, I, I was sharing there, I said, you know, how do you make progress spiritually? In the spirit, the only way you make progress is by giving, is by serving. Find somewhere to serve. Find someone to serve. Find someone to give. Because until you are empty, God doesn't visit you. The moment you give, amen, God sees you as the next person he needs to visit to put something into. 
And that is the power of fellowship. Amen. I don't want to preach another message because another message is coming up now. Amen. Hallelujah. But let us pray this morning and just speak to God that that light inside you, it will shine. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have a great destiny in God. I want you to lift up your voice. There are about three messages here. But this morning, I want you to speak to God. And I know there are people here today or watching online that this is a season that is crucial for you. It's a season of victory. And it's a season where you need to align with the right people. When Jesus came, the first thing he did was he found himself disciples, those who will walk with him. The first miracle Jesus did, what happened was that he found those who will fill the pictures. And so our life is never alone. You are somebody's miracle. Just the same way you are surrounded with people who will be the, miracle, the instrument of miracle in your life. I want you to speak this morning. You know, when Gideon went to, to destroy the altar of Baal in his father's house, because that was his own assignment, God said, go and start in your own house. He went with 10 people. In other words, there were 10 people who already believed in him and went with him to do that assignment. Who are you mentoring? Who are you investing in? Whose life are you touching? I want you to pray this morning and say, Lord, bring me into that place of destiny where heaven begins to answer, where God begins to show me who I truly am in the spirit. Lift up your voice. Speak to God right now. Just speak to God this morning. Speak to God this morning. Father, we give you thanks, we give you thanks, we give you glory, we give you praise. I call heaven and earth to align this morning for everyone here and those who are listening online. That as Jesus prayed, that as it is in heaven, so let it be on earth. That every confusion be removed. That this light will shine. Every struggle with this outer flesh Lord, we declare today in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, the power to overcome, the grace to overcome, the power of obedience, Lord, let it be released today in every heart, in every life. You know, when you start to obey, faith starts to grow. Obedience empowers faith. Obedience empowers faith. Obedience empowers faith. So just obey in little things and you have faith to obey in bigger things. And so, Father, we thank you. We give you glory this morning. We come to this table with faith. We come to this table this morning to just release ourselves into who we are in God. You are God's child. Thank you. You are God's friend. You are God's masterpiece. You are justified. You are free from condemnation. I want you to think about all that God has done. There's a message, <laughs> you know, the Lord gave me, and, um, and, uh, I still haven't preached it yet. But I'm just going to give you the headline. And, and God said, God, God said to me, He said, look at the cross. Look at the cross. Amen. Look at the cross. At the cross, what happened? The feet of Jesus were nailed together. He said, make your walk narrow. He said, your walk has to be narrow. 
Your work has to be narrow. Your work has to be narrow in the world. Amen. But he said, what about the hands of Jesus? They were what? They were wide. He says, so make the works of your hand wide. Cross every border. He said, let your work be narrow. Don't depart from the scriptures, but let your heart be large. Let your heart be what? Let your heart be large. Let your hand be wide. Amen. Praise God. And when I talked to I talked to entrepreneurs, I said, you know, God, heaven is full of ideas. And you have ten fingers. So until you have ten businesses or ten things, then you should lose stop. <laughs> you can handle you can handle more than that. Amen. But let your let 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 what you can embrace be wide. Amen. Let your path be narrow. Keep on that path. But be able to embrace people from different backgrounds, from different cultures, from, you know, don't be discri don't discriminate. Don't be narrow in your mind. Be narrow in your work. But don't be narrow in where you want to touch and where you want to bless <laughs> and how you want to hallelujah okay I've not preached that message yet I'm still researching it praise God so don't go and preach it behind my back <laughs> hallelujah praise God lift up your hands and let's take this communion together I want us to ask God to teach us how to trust him. I want, Lord, I want to trust you more. I want to trust you more. I want to trust you more.